it's it's devastating corals in the Caribbean right now. The last few years, it's been a huge problem. It's a, a major ongoing area of research. Um, and every time one of those papers comes out, I grab the DNA sequences from it and compare it to our database and say, OK, do we have any of these bugs in the hobby? Um, and it turns out that that some of them are are pretty, pretty common in the hobby. Um, some of these some of these bacteria associated with the disease are really strongly associated. Like you only find them in the diseased corals and you always find them in the diseased corals. Are your corals struggling and even dying? Well, in today's video, which is a part of the Aquabiomics series, we're gonna take a look at a common coral pathogen that could be causing the problem. Now, this video is a part of a series of videos where I take a look at a conversation that I had with Dr. Eli from Aquabiomics. So let's jump right into it. Like I mentioned, I had cyanobacteria, but it looks like um, it was pretty well taken care of. It looks like there's a few um, different groups still in here if you want to. Yeah, so I, I see one group here, um, and and it's at pretty low levels. Um, mm -hmm. It is it is a group that includes some filamentous types. This is one of the things I'm always curious about. What kind of cyano do you have? Some are filamentous. That is, they form filaments. Those filaments form the mat. That kind of ugly. Yeah, it's called a mat. Yeah. Um, is it sim similar to this right here? Yeah, I mean, it's it's similar to really all the nuisance algae. They all grow that kind of mat down on the sand, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, the filamentous types of the cyanobacteria are the ones that form mats like that. And so that's a question I always ask. You, your sample did have um, a filamentous group of cyano, but it was at very low levels. Um, right. Oh, that was that was dinos that I just showed right, right. there. But, but yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so very low levels of cyano. That and that one popped up. That was one of the first things that popped up uh, when I set up this tank uh, was cyano, yeah. and then I, I knocked that out with um, like a red slime remover. Got it. Um, so that probably affected the biome a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was it was pretty effective. Um, but yeah, so fish pathogens. Yeah, uh, great. Vibrio fortis, yes. Vibrio fortis, yeah. So super common in the hobby. Something like a half the tanks that we've tested have this. I mean, it's really common. But um, probably not a concern in most tanks. The only papers I can find really linking it to disease are in seahorses and their relatives. So, you know, before you put that expensive uh, pipe fish, what's the pretty one, the blue striped one or whatever, before right. you put an expensive pipe fish in here, you know, I, I would want to check if you have it. But um most of us aren't raising pipefish and seahorses, so it's probably not a big issue. Um, with that said, it, it is a pathogen that in direct experiments seems to affect a wider range of fish. Like if you deliberately infect fish with it, they can it can affect a wider range. So okay. it may be contributing to some issues in the hobby. Um, I don't think it's really a big issue to be worried about unless you're growing seahorses because it's in so many tanks mm -hmm. if it was killing a lot of fish you know we we'd know about it by now gotcha um, so i i generally i generally pass over vibrio fortis and say not a big concern the the coral pathogen is an interesting one um so i'm calling it a suspected pathogen because there's a there's a formal process that scientists go through to designate a bacterium as a pathogen um it involves sort of five or six major experimental steps, and they're really hard to do in corals. We're certainly not there for this disease. The disease is called SCTLD, stony coral tissue loss disease. Okay. Unfortunate acronym. It's hard to pronounce. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's it's devastating corals in the Caribbean right now. The last few years, it's been a huge problem. It's a, a major ongoing area of research. Um, and every time one of those papers comes out, I grab the DNA sequences from it and compare it to our database and say, OK, do we have any of these bugs in the hobby? Um, and it turns out that that some of them are are pretty, pretty common in the hobby. So um, the the paper I pulled this um, this sequence from, they identified something like seven or so microbes that are associated with um, with the disease. And I keep saying associated. So what I mean there is like 
they find this bacterium in the diseased corals mm -hmm. either uh, more frequently or at a higher level than in healthy corals. Um, some of these some of these bacteria associated with the disease are really strongly associated. Like you only find them in the diseased corals and you always find them in the diseased corals. So, so it's, it's pretty good evidence. It's, it's just not enough evidence to conclusively say that the, the bacterium is causing the disease. Um, okay. So they came from, you know, peer reviewed publications from this ongoing research. And I found the exact same DNA sequence, uh, in your tank. This was for one of the, one of the common ones. Um, I don't recall, let me pull up the, the report on my screen so I can see it better. Um, yeah, the Planktotelia species. So this is one of the more common ones. Um, this guy occurs in 19% of the tanks that we've tested. Um, so, you know, about one in five tanks has it. Um, the levels in your tank were not unusually high. They were within the typical range. So your tank has a suspected coral pathogen. It's absolutely there. It's the same one that's present in about 20% of tanks. And the levels in your tank are similar to what we see in those other tanks. Okay. So what do we do with that information? Well, yeah. if you have ongoing coral diseases in your tank, I, I think this is a prime candidate to consider. You know, we, we haven't found any other coral pathogens or any other coral parasites or pests in your samples. Um, this is the only coral bug that we've found. So I think it's a I think it's a good candidate. That doesn't mean that I'd recommend you, you know, dump a bunch of antibiotic in your tank or something like that. Um, yeah. So so I mean, so is a solution maybe to pull those corals out and do a coral dip or since the pathogen is in the tank, that's really not going to affect the corals because like you were saying it's uh, like if the coral's healthy at this low level it may not it the coral may be okay yeah, uh, yeah but it's it's when the coral becomes unhealthy that it starts just taking it down yeah so i mean i think i think the advice always comes down to a case-by-case -case basis you know now we know the bugs in your tank mm -hmm. so if we see corals doing badly and it, it sounds like you you still have one or more corals showing symptoms is that right yeah, it's, it's mostly um, euphelias, yeah, okay. hammer corals. Yeah. I've had a trachea go down too, so. Yeah, so um, so then there's a couple things that we could do at this point. You could start experimenting with the benefits of an antibiotic dip. <clears throat> you know, the, the bugs in your tank, um, mm -hmm. but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have a, a colony of it you know, a population of it colonizing the, the corals themselves, right? So you could take kind of an experimental approach to explore that, saying, well, if I take one of my euphilia out and do an antibiotic dip, do I see any improvement? You know, if you do see some improvement, that would be consistent with the idea that this bug, we now know it's there, is, you know, contributing to the disease and, and it might support kind of moving forward and treating the rest of them. Um, if you do that, my recommendation would be amoxicillin. Um, it's not the easiest one to find, but it is out there marketed for fish. Um, hmm. And I would use it at the similar concentrations that they recommend for fish. Okay. Um, it's probably a really small, small dose. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, I, I'm not a fan of the sledgehammer approach with aqua with with antibiotics um because we know there are such a thing as beneficial microbes even if we don't know what they all are and even if we don't know what they're all doing we know there's such a thing as beneficial microbes so i'm i i try to i try to start on the low end with any antibiotic treatments whether it's dip or an in-tank treatment let's start on the low end um and see if we can kill the target without killing everything else so yeah, some some low dip, low dosage dip of amoxicillin is something you could experiment with. You know, that's a path you could take. Another path we could take at this point is to say, okay, I know it's in the tank, mm -hmm. but I don't know is it actually infecting my corals. And we could follow up with a swab sample of your of 
an affected coral itself um, to pursue that. You know, that that would be, I guess, the more cautious way. You know, we could take it step by step and say, I'm going to first check, is it actually there? Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's an option, too. Um, OK, could take a wait and see approach and just say, well, if there's not if there's not any major outbreak, maybe I just don't touch anything and see what happens. But just this knowledge that there's a bacterial pathogen in the tank, kind of keep that in your pocket. And if you see a major outbreak emerge, you don't have to do a lot of research all of a sudden to figure out what is it. You yeah. can act quickly and say, I'm going to do an antibiotic treatment because I know I've got a, got a bug. Yeah, because I've been really slow to add coral. Like I love hammer corals and frog spawn corals, mm, yeah. but I've been really slow to add them only because I see them decline. Yeah. Um, and in previous tanks of mine, it really hasn't been a problem. Yeah. Um, so I'm mainly adding like mushroom corals and zoanthid corals uh, at the gotcha. moment. Yeah. So. Yeah, they're it's tragic when you fill a die because they die so quickly and they're, mm -hmm. they're pretty and they're usually not cheap. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, since you're a fan of Euphilia, I'm glad to see that we didn't find any of the Archibacter. So there's a, another one of the really new things that we've learned in our work at Aquabiomics is this, this pathogen um, that causes, I'm convinced it is the cause of brown jelly disease. Now that yeah. there, there may be other contributing factors, you know, the work is not done, but I believe it is the cause of brown jelly disease. We've seen this association so strongly, uh, repeatedly. Mm -hmm. We find the same thing in tanks from Europe down to the identical DNA sequence, you know, not a base pair different, oh, again, wow. associated with uh, brown jelly disease. Um, yeah, so it was really nice to not see that in your tank. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we saw this suspected coral pathogen, and I'm kind of giving you this soft advice about, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dose you. I wouldn't nuke your tank over the presence of this. You know, you might yeah. move slowly, right? Yeah. If we saw Archibacter type eleven oh three in your tank, I would feel differently. It, oh. it, it is one that I don't like to see at all in a tank. I don't consider there to be a safe level, um, especially in a tank with euphilia. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. So get that one out as quick as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so. We didn't find we didn't find the worst ones in your tank. I guess that's the context okay. I'm trying to, well, trying to share. Well, that's good. That's very good. <laughs> now, is this um, can you kind of wait wait this out? Is this the type of thing where like if other um, archaea or bacteria is like out competing this pathogen, well, does it disappear over time, or is it just it just hangs around doing its thing? Yeah, I mean, I. I, th I think the safe answer here is to say that we don't know yet, but mm -hmm. I I'm going to speculate based on what we know that I, I think that this group of bacteria, we should expect them to persist in the aquarium, even without any corals around. Um, you know, this is not like, uh, it's not like leaving the tank fallow to get rid of it, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, these are normal parts of the community. So these, these bacteria associated with SCTLD, they're all part of the Rhodobacteraceae. This is one of the top five most abundant groups in the, in the microbiome. It's, it's the dominant part of the biofilm that is the family, the family Rhodobacteraceae, dominant part of the biofilm. Um, and these, these uh, pathogens or suspected pathogens, they're living right in there with all the other Rhodobacteraceae in the biofilm all over the tank um they're a normal part of the community not just around when there's an infection so yeah i am skeptical that short of an antibiotic treatment or something i'm skeptical that that we're going to wipe them out of out of the tank um we recently you know of course can't give any names but we recently sampled a bunch of tanks um from a, a fish dealer you know somebody who who buys and sells lots of fish they don't deal with corals at all, not a coral in their facility, but boy, every single one of their tanks had these SCTLD uh, pathogens in them. So they're definitely growing in tanks, even when there's no corals around. They, they're widespread in the hobby. I'm, I'm skeptical you would get rid of it by waiting it out or, or changing conditions. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. I mean, cause I mean, we get corals from all over, all over the place, many different stores. So we're bringing in, a bunch of 
different water. I mean, you acclimate corals and you try not to add that water to your tank. It's like a rule sure. of thumb. Um, but like, I mean, the tiniest drop. Yeah. Can, yeah. Yeah. And these guys, these uh, members of the Rotobacter ACA, any of the SCTLD associated bacteria, they're, they're biofilm, right? So they're clinging mm -hmm. to the coral frag plug, mm -hmm. the coral yes. skeleton. They may actually be, a, whether it's healthy or diseased, they can be a part of the coral microbial community itself on the coral tissue. So, gotcha. So not yeah. so not just the water. It's on the plug as you're putting it in the tank. In fact, primarily primarily, primarily not yeah. in the water. It's primarily on the plug. Yeah, we we find it in the water too. But um, yeah, they're mostly biofilm uh, organisms. So, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. These these things are going to get into your tank. It is likely. Um, but you know, not inevitable. Um, we don't find them in every tank, right? This one is only twenty percent, and it's one of the most common ones. The other members of the group. Um, they're they're rarer. They show up in mm -hmm. maybe five percent of tanks. So, I I am a fan. I do think all of this testing, you know, supports the practice that many of us have adopted of being really careful about what we put in our tanks. Right? Not right. necessarily nuking it with harsh chemical dips, but at, at the very least, cleaning it well, inspecting mm -hmm. it well. You know, putting in a minimum amount of external material and making that material as known as you possibly can, right? Inspect yeah. it or treat it. It truly amazes me the things that you can discover from a water sample and a biofilm sample uh, whenever you send it out to Aquabiomics. I hope you enjoyed this video and that you learned something about coral pathogens. If you'd like to see the first part of the video series, then go ahead and click right here. And I have another video for you here as well. Thank you so much for watching, liking, and subscribing, and I'll see you in the next one.